Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lester, and I will be your operator for Crescent Point Energy's fourth quarter 2023 conference call. This conference call is being recorded today and will be webcast along with a slide deck, which can be found on Crescent Point's website homepage. The webcast may not be recorded or rebroadcast without the express consent of Crescent Point Energy. All amounts discussed today are in Canadian dollars, with the exception of West Texas Intermediate, or WTI, pricing which is quoted in U.S. dollars. The complete financial statements and management discussion and analysis for the period ending December 31, 2023, were announced this morning and are available on Crescent Point, Cedar Plus, and Edgar websites. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remark, there will be a question and answer session for members of the investment community. If you would like to ask a question over the phone line during this time, simply press star, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star two. During the call, management may make projections or other forward-looking statements regarding future events or future financial performance. Actual performance, events, or results may differ materially. Additional information or factors that could affect Crescent Point's operation or financial results are included in Crescent Point's most recent annual information form, which may be accessed through Crescent Point, Cedar Plus, or Edgar websites, or by contacting Crescent Point Energy. Management also calls your attention to the forward-looking information and non-GAAP measures sections of the press release issued early today. I will now turn the call over to Craig Brixa, President and Chief Executive Officer of Crescent Point. Please go ahead, Mr. Brixa. Thank you, Operator. I'd like to welcome everyone to our fourth quarter 2023 conference call. With me today are Ken Lamont, our Chief Financial Officer, and Justin Fourier, our Vice President of Operations and Marketing. On today's call, I will first touch on a few of our key accomplishments in 2023 and will then provide some insight into our reserves and our five-year outlook. Looking back at our Q4 results and our success through 2023, our most remarkable achievement has been how significantly we have transformed our portfolio and how it has materially strengthened Crescent Point's future outlook. These strategic steps were taken with purpose to secure premium drilling inventory depth in world-class basins. In doing so, we focused on acquiring oil and liquids-weighted assets that provide synergies to our existing business and also enhance our long-term excess cash flow generation and return a capital profile for our shareholders. Through our efforts, we have built a portfolio that now has over 20 years of premium drilling inventory. We also control the largest land position in both the condensate-rich KBOB Duvernay play and the volatile oil window in the Alberta mountains. The portfolio we have built provides us with significant running room and growth potential in these plays, coupled with our high net back, low decline assets in Saskatchewan. In KBOB, we continue to be impressed by the strong oil production and the consistent, repeatable success we've achieved since entering the play in 2021. Similar to KBOB, our well productivity in the Alberta Monty has been remarkable. We have achieved IP30 results that continually rank in the top 10 oil and liquids wells in the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. In fact, 25 of the top 30 oil wells in the Alberta Monty over the past year are now owned by Crescent Point. We're incredibly excited about the addition of this new asset to our portfolio and eager to report back as we further develop this world-class resource. With our successful portfolio transformation, our focus now turns to operational execution enhancing our balance sheet strength, and increasing our return of capital to our shareholders. In 2023, we generated $980 million of excess cash flow, $600 million of which was returned directly to our shareholders through dividends and share repurchases. We remain committed to returning 60% of our excess cash flow to our shareholders and are pleased to raise our base dividend once again to 11.5 cents per quarter or 46 cents per share on an annualized basis. Even with this dividend increase, we maintain a very conservative budget that is fully funded at low commodity price of $55 per barrel WTI, assuming our current cost structure and capital expenditures guidance. 
The strength of our portfolio and our operational execution continue to generate significant value for our shareholders, as demonstrated in our 2023 reserve metrics. Last year, we replaced over 900% of our 2023 production, including strategic A&D, on a 2P reserve basis. We replaced 150% of our 2023 production organically, driven largely by increased reserves additions in our KBOB Duvernay asset. By entering into the Alberta Montney, we added significant reserves in 2023, increasing our total corporate reserve life index to approximately 16 years. When factoring in our organic additions and strategic a and I'm pleased to report that our 2P finding development and acquisition costs in 2023 generated a very strong recycle ratio of 2.5 times, including change in future development capital. It's also worth highlighting that approximately 60% of our premium locations in the KBOB Duvernay and over 70% of our inventory in the Alberta Montney remain unbooked at year-end 2023 allowing for future reserve additions. Looking ahead, we're forecasting production of 198 to 206,000 BOE per day with development capital expenditures of 1.4 to $1.5 billion in 2024. Operationally, we, we will continue to focus on enhancing efficiencies and returns, including drilling longer laterals in the KBOB Duvernay and optimizing well design and inner well spacing in the Alberta Monte. We have begun drilling on our recently acquired lands, utilizing our new well design, and look forward to sharing our results in the second half of 2024. In Saskatchewan, we will continue to advance our decline mitigation programs and our open hole multilateral development. We expect to generate significant excess cash flow of approximately $830 million under our 2024 budget, assuming a full year average WTI pricing of approximately $75 per barrel and ACO of $230 per MCF. We continue to earmark 60% of our excess cash flow for shareholders with approximately $500 million expected to be delivered this year through a combination of dividends and share purchases. Our significant excess cash flow generation and return of capital in 2024 is further complemented by our five-year plan, which is set to deliver excess cash flow per share growth on a compounded annual basis of approximately 10% at $70 per barrel of WTI. In aggregate, we expect to generate cumulative excess cash flow of $4.7 billion under our five-year plan. We believe our plan provides shareholders with a compelling combination of high net back production, strong excess cash flow generation, a significant return of capital, in addition to organic per share growth. In closing, I'd like to reiterate just how excited we are about our Transform portfolio. We, signif- we have significantly enhanced our five-year outlook and we're excited to few- to further bolster our returns for each of our assets. I'd like to thank our shareholders for all their support and continued engagement as we've transformed our business. We look forward to providing more details on our operational results and long-term development plan at our upcoming investor day on March 20th. I'd also like to thank our staff who continue to demonstrate our commitment to operational excellence with yet another safest year on record. We'll now open the call to questions from the investment community followed by questions from the webcast. Operator, please open the line. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will now conduct the question and answer session. Just a reminder, if you have a question, please press star one on your telephone touchpad. And if you wish to cancel your request, please press star two. Your first question comes from Aaron Bilkowski. Your line from TD, your line is now open. Thanks. Morning, Craig. I have a couple of reserve-related questions. The first is related to the technical revisions. I was hoping you could provide some details mm-hmm. on what drove the oil and NGL technical revisions in the probable category. Yeah, good morning, and thanks for the question, Aaron. So as far as reserves, uh, really good numbers when you look at it this year, like I had mentioned on the call, uh, 2P FD&A recycle ratio of 2.5 times. Um, so really strong on those numbers. When you look at the technical revisions, we were somewhere in the neighborhood in and around that 13-ish million uh, total on performance and then technicals on the negative side. About half of that, Aaron, is driven through op costs uh, in more of our legacy assets, so in our Saskatchewan plays. And by definition, those are, are called technicals when you truncate the back end uh, of the curves. And then the other half of that actually is in a couple of the assets that we ended up 
uh, moving off here over uh, over the last quarter. So when you look in, at Swan Hills and Turner Valley. So, you know, as far as the base business going forward, reserves look really good, really tight. Um, KBOB came in very strong for us this year. And then, of course, when you look at the Montney with us doing that, those series of deals this year, uh, those ac um, reserves came in under uh, acquisition. So, you know, you'll see cleaner version of that as we roll into 2024. Thanks, Greg. That's helpful. If I could follow it up with yep. another question on the FDC. When I look at the FDC in the reserve sure. report, it looks like capital expenditures are growing to a little over $1.7 billion by 2027. How should I reconcile that against your corporate five-year plan that has corporate capex hovering around that 1.45 range over that period? Yeah, so w when you look at our development plan within our reserves, um, one thing that we really like about it is um, – our FDC uh, fairly tightly follows our, our um, five-year plan here in the near term. And then more importantly, we only have roughly, call it six and a half years of, of our inventory booked. And that ties into what you're seeing on that FDC. So for us, you know, it, it's tough, Aaron, to get them exact um, between the, the independents and, and how we see our budget. But, you know, fairly tight when you look at it here in the near term in the five years. And then again, roughly only about a a six and a half year uh, FDC outlook or profile going forward is, is how we've got it. So what that really speaks to is what I mentioned on the call. So you've only got, you know, call it 30% uh, or sorry, 25 to 30% of the Montney uh, locations booked and then only about 40% of the Duvernay locations booked. So that really speaks to um, how we're going to be able to add reserves organically as we move the business forward here throughout the year. So. You know, I guess it's my long way of saying, Aaron, it's really tough to get those exact between the, the two firms, uh, but we feel really good about how they line up in the five years. And, and then, more importantly, if you double back, Aaron, and, and get a look at the production profile the independents have, both on a 1P and 2P basis, it's pretty tight to what we're showing in the five-year plan. Perfect. Thanks for that, Craig. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for your questions, Aaron. Your next question comes from Travis Wood from National Bank Financial. Your line is now open. Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, wanted to touch on M&A. Uh, you have some uh, ongoing divestiture uh, processes in the works, and at the same time, there's some opportunities to continue to consolidate your core area, specifically across the Duvernay, with some asset packages out for sale from others. So how, how are you thinking about M&A now, um, and why not use this kind of opportunity to continue to buy some inventory while it's uh, on sale? Hey, Travis, thanks for the question. Um, you know, so very active on, on that front over the last year. I think we're extremely happy with how our portfolio has come together and really the transformation on the portfolio. Uh, more importantly for us, when you look at not only our five, but our 10-year plan, uh, how that looks moving forward. And then again, now on the back end of, of the latest transaction, we've got 20 years of premium drilling inventory in front of us, Travis, and it, it looks it, it looks really good for us into the future. As far as acquisitions, um, we're not going to be doing anything on that front. So, you know, on the acquisitions, I would say no. Um, as far as the dispositions, we've got a couple smaller things that we're we're working through as we continue to um, focus in our asset base into to, um, what we're really looking for on that front. So there's a couple of, of things out there that we're working through. Um, I would tell you we're in the middle of the process on that. Um, and as we get some clarity on how that's going to play out, we'll give the, the market a, an, an update around that. But, you know, that'll be it for us here this year is the focus on some of these dispos um, and nothing on the acquisition front. The other thing I'd highlight for you too, Travis, is not only a couple of the asset packages we're looking at, but we are we're starting to think through um, potential on infrastructure and what does that mean for us going forward as well too. So. Okay, great and good color on that. Thanks, Craig. Um, a painful question, but I need to ask it. Um, any any uh, dialogue with River Riverstone and um, kind of how how they're potentially thinking about? Their equity stake. I know since the deal, they're they're a bit underwater on it by 10% or so. Um, but have you had any dialogue with them in terms of how we should think about that block that's out there potentially? Yeah, and I so it is a painful question, Travis, and you do have to ask ask it. So we absolutely get it. 
No, and and like you mentioned, you know, on the on the back end of that deal, part of the deal, um, which was again very strategic deal for us, and and made a lot of sense when you think of the long term business uh, of Crescent Point. Um, so on the back end of the deal, part of the consideration was moving equity into to Riverstone as they were the major shareholder, uh, like you mentioned, of Hammerhead, um, to the tune of around 40-ish million shares, Travis, of which you have lockups for a th- split 50% for a three and six month period. So the first uh, lockup is, is is after the first three months and then that remainder is after the second. Um, that being said, we've, we've I've had conversations with Riverstone, both Ken and I, um, right now, they are extremely happy shareholders and, and things are going well. Um, we'll see how this ends up playing out for them uh, and, and how long uh, they're looking at holding. But, you know, with us right now, good conversation, good dialogue, very happy shareholders. Um, and then we'll see how this, this ends up playing out. Uh, you know, I, I don't expect, um, you know, anything material here to work through that over the next little bit, Travis. But we're we're again in dialogue and working through with them. Okay, thanks. Thanks for uh, humoring me there, and, and I'll turn it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. Turning now over to Shant Mandian for web questions. Okay, Sean. Yeah, thanks, operator. Uh, there was a couple of questions there on A and D, which I think you've answered through Travis's uh, question. Um, a question here on on KBOP. Um, any follow-up well results that you can speak to that you need to give you a little bit more comfort as you step out across the land base? Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things we love about KBOP is just how consistent and repeatable it's been for us here since we entered the play in, in March 2021. Um, we most, most recently brought on another pad that is pushing to the east and to the south of the play. It is in the, the uh, volatile oil window. Um, and it's in an area where um, the previous operator had some, some what I would describe as more challenging results. Uh, so this really offsets, if you remember, our FC806 pad this year came online in, within and around that area, in and around that 1,500-ish BOE, BOE per day on average well on that pad is around 75-ish percent liquids. I'm happy to tell you that that second pad we just brought on is, is in and around that, that range. So it's been on for a little over 30 days. Uh, flowing at us very strong in and around 1,500 BOE per day per well and right around that 75% liquid. So it's a good follow-up to uh, a good result this year in an area where the previous operator had some challenging um, maybe results and it really pushes to the south and the east. So excited about that one. Um, Similar on the KBOB, another follow-up there with respect to the development plans within the phase windows. So when you look at the location count that we have between the volatile oil window and the liquids rich, uh, within our 10-year plan, how do you think about the lean gas development within there uh, over that period? Yeah, so so for us being a liquids company, we're going to zero in and focus on both the volatile oil window and the liquids rich window here in the near term over the the next both five and, and 10 years. Uh, and then as we slowly press to the south and a little bit to the west, you start to get more into that um, leaner gas, which, again, still has a, a decent amount of liquids coming with it as well. So for us, both the five- and ten-year plans really zero in on, on the volatile oil and liquids rich window. And then beyond ten years is how we start to look as we, we push into the south and the west. And, again, inventory supports that, so no reason to advance any faster. Thanks for that. Uh, moving to the Montney uh, question here, when we should expect to see results on CPG's optimal well design on the newly acquired Hammerhead lands um, and any other additional follow-up on well results that you can speak to as well from recent, uh, recent from our recent program? Sure. So um, just so every, everyone's aware of that deal closed on December 21st of last year. We picked up operations that have been running. Uh, since then, we are on our first pads right now that are under that new Crescent Point design. Um, we're drilling away. I would say operations are going really strong for us on, on that front, so things look good. Um, that first pad that will get done and completed under our new well design. So, again, remember that's uh, slightly wider spacing, slightly different completion techniques. Um, will be probably mid-June by the time that the pad is, is completed and online. And then by the time we have results, I would, I would expect some uh, potentially around that Q2 
um, press release. So at the end of July, early August timing on that front. So excited about it though. I, uh, operations have been going pretty good. And then as far as um, follow-up results, we've had a, a few good ones here come on when you look at uh, the Montney position that we picked up and, and really across the place. So both from the Eastern side, moving to the West and then pushing down South. Um, so if you, if you think of, there's a six of five pad that has come on um, over the last 80 days, it's been online, which is east to the north, sorry, the, the northeastern position of our land. Um, those results uh, have been have been coming in pretty well, in and around that 1450 BOE per day. Uh, it's a little bit gassier over on that side at around 45% liquids, but again, good strong uh, flowing production results on that pad. On average, is the, the wells on that. When you look at Gold Creek West, where if everybody's familiar. Uh, that's where when we did the original Spartan Delta transaction, um, Spartan Delta had brought on that original two and nine well that was uh, in that two hundred or two thousand ish BOE per day at ninety percent oil. Uh, we've offset that pad here and have had uh, that new pad for us come online over the last. It, it's pretty early. These are early results. So in that last ten, uh, fifteen days, and, and on average, we're in that call it eighteen hundred to twenty two hundred BOE per day. Uh, and an in and around that 90% oil. So good, strong results from that pad. And keep in mind that is a four well pad. So it's really been coming at us strong. And then again, if you push down south on the hammerhead position, I, I would highlight that maybe even a couple of the analyst notes picked up on, on a couple of the wells on that uh, five of 11 pad uh, that hammerhead had, had been drilling right as we took over. Um, those wells are online, some good early results uh, in there. But I, I would also, Put a caveat in there that keep in mind we were bringing that new battery on online during that period so that the chatter of operations obviously occurs so you get some chatter in those hours to get the kinks worked out of that battery but uh, wells are online um, seem to be doing just doing pretty good um, but we'll continue to monitor that and and uh, see how it goes okay, thanks for that Craig um, maybe shifting here to you, Ken, just as a return of capital question. It looks like buyback activity has been a little quiet here in Q1 to date. Uh, can you just explain any rationale behind that? And at the same time, what should we expect going forward as preference between buybacks and dividends? And has anything changed as far as our return of capital framework? Sure. So maybe I'll start with that uh, part of the question. No, we uh, haven't changed anything as far as our return of capital policy goes. We are uh, going to return 60% of our excess cash base dividend. The preference over and above David base dividend will be share repurchases only. Um, so expect that. With respect to the, the share repurchase and the lack of activity in January, that's just really a, a timing issue. Um, as, as everyone knows on the call here, we added a second rig into the Duvernay in the fall of this year, and we're on a bit of a growth ramp as you look at the production profile within 2024. So um, there's a little less free cash here in Q1. Um, and so, obviously, we just manage our buybacks in accordance with when our free cash uh, is being generated. And so, um, that's why you see a, a little lack of activity in January. But expect as we grow our production, grow our free cash flow during this year, that activity will um, commensurate increase with that. So, it's just a timing issue. Nothing else. The policy hasn't changed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe another question for you just around debt management strategy. What are some of the tools in the toolkit and, and things that we're – working towards to try and get towards our lower targets at one time to lower commodity prices? Sure. So obviously um, on the back end of the hammerhead transaction, um, our debt uh, did increase to 3.7 billion. And so, you know, this has been uh, outside of uh, operations this year. Our next priority is obviously balance sheet. And uh, the tools in the toolkit, um, you know, first thing is we do generate um, significant excess cash flow um, and we do retain 40% of that. Um, and so that's really the, the first weapon that's always in the background that's paying down your debt as you go. So, you know, we, we do generate really good excess cash and, and we'll dedicate that retained portion to the balance sheet only. Um, I would say secondly, um, we've talked about the disposition. Um, we obviously and in, in, in did talk about uh, no acquisitions uh, right now, but we are looking and active on the disposition front. And I would say you saw us being very active in Q4 with a couple of Alberta properties. We've announced that. Um, so we've, we've had those processes go by. We are looking at some other non-core, smaller dispositions here. Um, we've got two formal processes. 
We also are running, um, you know, a few informal processes here as well, too. As Craig alluded to, it can be upstream, um, looking at uh, other things as well, too, and that infrastructure, gores, things like that. So um, I think we have a lot of tools in the toolkit, and I just want to make, you know, clear that, you know, this is a priority for us. And outside of free cash flow, we are going to make some dispositions and get our debt down. Probably also worth mentioning the, the hedges that we have in place to continue to uh, to protect on the downside. Yeah, it's a fair comment. We're about 45% hedged on the oil side and 30% hedged on the gas side. So obviously we've layered on significant protection of that free cash flow as we look out this year and into early 2025. So very solid on that front, and and you know that'll help uh, take the volatility of our excess cash out of the equation as well. I mentioned the gas because there's or the hedges because there are two additional questions related to that. So first on the gas side. Uh, the question is, given the collapse in gas prices, how is CPG managing its gas exposure to ensure profitability of some of its newer assets? Sure. So uh, maybe I'll just start a little bit on, on the hedge side. Obviously, you know, cost and cost control comes comes into play as well, too. But from a hedge perspective, we do have 30 percent uh, of our gas uh, fixed price um, hedged out over two years, so 2024 and 2025. Um, you'll see that in our corporate presentation. You know, these are at four bucks a GJ and above. So very strong uh, hedge book on the gas side. Um, secondly, uh, you'll see in our disclosure as well, too, that um, we've also moved our um, basis exposure away from ACO. Um, we're now kind of in that 20% uh, exposed to ACO, and we've diversified that away to various points, um, being NYMEX, Don, Malin, um, in the Chicago area. So. Um, not only from a fixed price perspective, we remove some risk on gas, but also from a basis perspective, um, we've done that as well. Okay. And the other side of that, on the oil side, can you discuss your hedging strategy, perhaps for the remainder of 2024 and maybe looking at 2025 as, as prices continue to move higher here? Yeah, so we obviously are hedgers um, and we'll continue to hedge. Um, I would say, you know, 45% for 2024 feels like a good level. Um, so, so I think um, that makes a lot of sense for us. And just given that we're still, you know, active in trying to deleverage, um, as that balance sheet uh, gets more into shape, we can look at the hedge percentage a little bit um, as we go forward as to what levels that we're looking for. Um, as you saw in the past when we were a little uh, lighter on, on the leverage side and on the debt side, um, we were kind of in that 20% uh, hedged range. So, um I would say look for that. Look for us to take advantages um, as the back end of the curve uh, hopefully does move up in 2025. Then we'll tip away there and uh, secure, you know, at least a year out um, and, and and looking just maybe slightly beyond that to where we can. Another question coming back on the return of capital. We've uh, stated our intention to increase the return of capital to shareholders over time. Can you provide any specifics on what that may entail? Sure. And, and so, um, Craig, do you want me to take this? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that um, as far as uh, our priorities right now, um, priorities, obviously, operational execution. The next one is our balance sheet. Um, the third one is increasing our return of capital. We've kind of stated that very clearly in all our literature. Um, with respect to that, we really do need to see our, you know, get our balance sheet paid down. Um, that will be the priority. So, you know, look for us to – um, have a target here of about a billion and a half dollars um, over the next couple of years of getting our balance sheet down. When we're in that position, that's when we would look to uh, potentially increase our return of capital proposition. Um, and that's really how we're thinking about that. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think at this time there are no additional questions from those listening on the line. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining our call today. And if you have any other additional questions that weren't answered, please call our investor relations team at your convenience. Thanks, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for joining. You may now disconnect.